Hello, my name is Garth Holman, and welcome to uh, Neotech 2020 Online. Um, this is a presentation called Students Create a Digital Textbook Using Google Slides, and I'm joined by JC Link and Travis Armstrong, so I'll give them a second to introduce themselves to you. Go ahead. Go ahead. Hey, everybody. JC Link here. Uh, Sixth grade social studies teacher at Beachwood Middle School. I've been uh, teaching social studies to sixth graders for 12 years now. Um, so this year we just started creating our own textbooks uh, using Google Sites. So we're going to kind of take you along on this journey and uh, hopefully you can get some ideas from this as well. But everything that goes down in my class uh, happens to show up in their textbooks. So um, pretty neat, pretty engaging then the students really enjoy it. So go ahead, Travis. No, I'm Travis Armstrong. Um, I teach seventh grade social studies in Dublin, Ohio. Um, this is my what, 12th year in teaching. Um, spent most of those in the seventh grade. Um, I had a, a few years that I would spend at the high school and um, I'll actually be demonstrating and showing the textbook that a couple of my high school students created, so. And my name is Garth Holman. Um, I'm a seventh grade social studies teacher in Beachwood, Ohio. So um, the three of us are doing this via Meets, and we're about uh, 100 miles, 130 miles from Travis, and about 45 miles from JC. So JC and Travis are about, and you guys are close to 200 miles apart, yeah. 175, something like that. So we may uh, fumble as we go through this, just trying to get the technology to work correctly. But um, I started an online textbook about 10 years ago. So we're going to kind of show you the history, the rationale for why we got there. Our contact information is here on the first slide, as well as uh, our emails will be in the notes at the bottom of the YouTube. So we're going to start with this concept. When we first started an online textbook, um, I believe it was back way back in 2008 and 9, we started talking about how to do this. And the original question was, how do we engage kids with content? And um, there was a book that had just come out by Dan Pink, who was actually from Columbus, Ohio, called Drive. And Mike Pennington, who is not here with us today, but he and I spent a lot of time talking about um, what needs to change in education. So I think at this point, JC, we're going to have you show that little video clip. It's about a minute and a half. We'll just let it play. You want to try to go big screen, see if it'll let me. I think the video lagged slightly a little bit as we were trying to watch it on there, but um, it kind of summarizes Dan Pink's whole book. Does anyone want to comment on that before we move on or say anything else there? I think Dan Pink's book can be um, used across the board in basically any any aspect of life. Um, and you know what we what we spend some time what we'll spend some time on here in the next couple of minutes is. Um, explaining how we see these concepts of autonomy, um, mastery, and purpose, um, how we see them working in the in the school, and how we are able to kind of utilize those to help um, get students intrinsically motivated and engaged in what they're doing. Yeah, and I'll add one more quick little idea. You know, we're sitting, we aren't presenting live at a conference because of the coronavirus here, 
which has kind of turned the world of education upside down, um, where people are trying to figure out um, with less rules, less regulations, what do we do? What do we do in this remote world? And I think um, that video, as I watched it again today, I see it differently than when we picked it to show it. Um, because now I'm thinking about people being, there's, there's a lot less rules, there's a lot less regulations. We just have to figure out how to engage our kids in this experiment that almost every teacher in the United States is trying to deal with right now. So um, hopefully it'll add some ideas about what you might be able to do over the next three or four weeks as there is a little more freedom with, for you to try things in your classroom um, without going off the, off the cliff is the way I'm gonna phrase it. You know, you can try something and see where it takes you. And I think teachers, that's kind of our job right now is to keep everybody motivated to keep progressing in their education. I mean, that's going to be, and hopefully that carries, carries on to whenever we can get back into the classroom as well. Yeah, good point. All right, well, let's roll on. So Travis, okay. you start here. Do you want to start? Yeah, so um, the three steps um, that have, again, kind of guided everything that we're doing and um, thus guiding us in the creation of these student textbooks um, are the three that are outlined here on the left, right? So we've got autonomy, mastery, and purpose. Um, so throughout the presentation here, we will we'll start with talking about the autonomy, what it looks like, what we mean by that in, um, within the school setting, and then mastery. Um, and then finally, we'll get down to the purpose. And the purpose is where we'll really, really showcase some of the um, examples of the student-created textbooks for you. All right, so, Go ahead. OK, so I'll go ahead and run with this one, too. So the first of the three steps is the is autonomy. Um, so when we talk about autonomy, um, we're we're also kind of talking about the same time, this constructivist theory. So constructivist theory um, where learners construct their own understanding based on their experiences. And um, with that comes a few different methods of teaching. So um, one of the biggest of those methods is self-directed, which links us to um, doing to Dan Pink's book with the autonomy part. So student directed, giving them some autonomy on what they're doing, how they're doing it. Um, so we can also throw out some of those, I hate to say buzzwords, but buzzwords of student centered and active learning. Um, but it's all it all relates back to providing the students um, autonomy on what they're doing, how they're doing it, and um, being able to collaborate and work with others. Right, and then the key for this is, uh, as a teacher, you know, I remember sitting back years ago thinking about, well, how do you do that? How do you really do self-paced learning with kids? How do you do self-directed learning? Um, you know, I'm a seventh grade social studies teacher required to teach certain standards. You can't just walk in and say, hey, what do you want to do today? Go ahead. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about providing, the way I've always used this analogy of like building a home. Like JC, Travis and I, we will construct a frame of a house. But that's kind of where we end. And those frames, the framing of that house, house is built on the standards that our kids need to know. But how they decorate, what do they put on that house? What kind of siding do they use? What kind of windows do they put in? What's the shingles look like? That's all up to them to figure out. As long as they're building off that foundation of the standards that we're required to teach, we allow kids autonomy to figure out how to show what they've learned. That's that constructivist theory kind of wrapped up in a shell. Yeah. And to piggyback off of that, I think um, we are fortunate and I think all I think most history or socialized classes are fortunate this way um, with having what is sometimes referred to as like as loose standards. So, you know, we have a standard that says, like, what is the enduring impact of the ancient Greeks? Well, there are a thousand different ways you can go with that enduring impact. So allowing them some of the flexibility to um, focus on the enduring impact that they want. Again, if there are things that we obviously know are, are important and want them to understand, we still put that within the framework, but then also trying to give them some of that that leniency to, to look at some things that are of interest for them. Now, let, right. go, ahead, go ahead, JC. And I think that this uh, self-directed learning is, really brings out the creativity that our students have. Uh, when you give them kind of guidelines or directions and not so much like, do exactly this, this, and this, 
and they have that freedom, they can be very creative, uh, you know, building on that foundation that we have given them. And it's pretty amazing. And you'll see some uh, examples in this presentation of what our students have done. Um, and that's the cool part to me. I, I really like giving them the foundation and then letting them build everything else and using their creativity however they want to. Well, I know I mentioned this in the recording we did yesterday on the gamification, but I think it's really important at this moment. Like um, in life, we're, we're, you know, when we give like rubrics, I'm not a huge fan of rubrics. I think that's been made clear multiple times. I'm not a huge fan of a rubric because a rubric tells a kid you do A, B, C, D, E, and that is a success. Well, that to me is, is another analogy is what a cook does. A cook follows recipe. They do exactly what they're told and you end up with the same meal over and over and over again and it's consistent. It's always the same. But what the world needs in, in today's world with technology, with the way the world's working is we need chefs. We need people who don't really follow a recipe but they have a basic understanding of how to mix things and combine to create something very unique. And the world is turning away from cooks more towards chefs to solve the problems we face in our society and in the broader world as well. So that concept of, of allowing kids, you know, I guess in a sense, to try to create chefs, not cooks. Now that's a really tricky problem. I look at this and we wouldn't usually talk about this at our session, I don't think. But, you know, what about a math teacher? What about a math teacher looking at us and listening to us talk? What does she do or he do when we're talking about these kind of things? And we might not have that answer. I don't know. I don't mean to put you guys on the spot. But how does this play out in a math class or how does this play out in a science class? I mean, well, I guess science should be that way because you have labs, you have other things you're doing that are kind of that way. Well, I think it plays out. Well, first, when, when you say that you're not a big fan of rubrics, I and, and I know you and I have had this conversation countless times. I don't, when you say that, I don't think that you truly mean that you aren't a fan of rubrics. I think you, or what you're saying is that you're not a fan of rubrics in terms of like, if you do, if you include, um, you know, five sentences within this paragraph, you get a three. I think the type of rubric, and I'll use the term rubric here loosely, that, that you are a fan of would answer this question for the math, which is, you need to show me that you understand this concept. And like, that is, as much as the rubric as there is, and maybe it's not a rubric, maybe it's the directions, but for a math teacher who wants the students to, I don't know, be able to give the volume of, of something, well, allow them to construct whatever it is that they want to then figure out the volume for. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. And your rubric point, and we'll move on right after this, maybe there's truth to what you're saying. And, and again, we've talked about this for years, but I know the only rubric I've really ever liked in my social studies class I've used with kids, I give them guiding rubrics to start learning how to write blogs or how to do things. But once that process is established, my best rubric I've ever used has been one that says add value to history, period. And then yeah. getting out of the way of the kid to try new things, because if part of schooling and part of what we want in people is risk takers who are willing to take chances, who learn from failure, then you have to give them that space to do that in a safe environment, which is what I think we're trying to create in our classrooms. Yeah, so, after you kind of train them what you want, then you're able to loosen up the rubric even further. Yeah, I think that's probably more accurate. Jason, anything else on that before we move on? No, I just say, you know, I like to give directions and then allow them the choice. You know, I'm, I'm big on student choice as well. So I give them directions on, you know, I want three pictures on this home page or whatever, and whatever three pictures you want that you know portray whatever we're going over. That's that's kind of my style, just giving directions and or setting my expectations and having the students follow follow them instead of actual like explicit rubrics where one point through five points for doing whatever. So yeah, I get that. All right, let's move on. We'll kind of get through some more of this here. Okay, so step two is the mastery part. Is the mastery part of Dan Pink's book? And going back to what um, Garth was saying um, a few minutes ago, when he was talking about how we provide them with the the framework of the house to, and then allow them to decorate it. So this mastery part is the guiding them of the framework. So for us, we have used um, whether we use WebQuest or um, I know JC uses um, uh, what what was the term that you guys came up with. HyperQuest. HyperQuest. Hyper um, either way, they're both kind of creating this 
this framework, and that's where we're tying the, the mastery part of Daniel Pink's concepts in. So I'll let somebody else go ahead and explain. I guess, Garth, do you want to talk through this? Yeah, book? let's, uh, JC, pick any one of those quests you want, doesn't matter to me. Okay, he picked the first one, which is the smallest one, but it gives you the gist of what we're doing here. So hopefully this loads. Um, go ahead and click one again, or whatever number you want, doesn't matter, that just took you to the, you're actually on the web. So on this, we always start with the same thing. We start with a um, flipped teaching style lesson that then immediately is followed by a Google form that they fill out while they're listening to the flip. So in this case, uh, you can see number one, we call them computer side chats, kind of a reference back to fireside chats. And there's a series of computer side chat questions. So right now you're seeing in one, this particular one, it, we're using Bayboard. Now, that's the name of it, right? Travis, yep, yep. Bayboard, which lets us draw on a thing over distance. Then we've got Google Forms embedded, which immediately provides self-corrected feedback that I don't have to grade. I can see a score, but I don't have to, to do that. We then scroll down, and there's always a series of vocabulary terms. In this case, um, I don't believe there's a ton of terms on this one. Um, we provide the Quizlet flashcards for them already created in language we think is more suitable for seventh graders so that they can play games, they can practice. We don't care, just know these words. And then in this case, we have a series of questions. Now, quest, this quest only had three questions, always open-ended. Um, and then there's a mastery quiz. The mastery quiz is back to a Google form that um, kids can take when they're ready. Um, we do a soft timeline, so we typically say, hey, you have until Thursday. Now, on this particular one, I don't know that I would give them four days to do this. Let's say this might be a two-day assignment versus a four-day. Um, but I have a soft deadline. We're going to do a quiz on this day. Some kids may take it a day early, but generally speaking, we take it on a certain time. The kids would show some kind of mastery through that quiz. Um, very few kids get below an 80. Um, if those kids, they would need some kind of reinforcement in a sense or reteaching in my mind where they didn't know certain things that they needed to. Then it would take them to the blog where they're creating, they're building, they're um, using Satori or ThingLink or they're building in Google Earth. It depends on which quest we're on, but they get much more in depth. Um, so if he scrolls back up a little bit, we ultimately have Google Google in here, we have podcasting in here, we have Bayboard in here, we have Quizlet in here. This particular one doesn't have a Digo, but we have Digo in there where the kids are sharing resources and highlighting together. They have Google Docs they can access to share across um, Dublin and Beechwood. Um, so there's all kinds of different technologies combined to make the kids' jobs easier, but at the same time to make it more collaborative, which gives kids purpose too. They're working with others. So I think that's kind of the overview of seventh grade of how we've traditionally tried to do it. This presentation isn't on that per se. So I think that might give you enough background of the flow of how we do it. JC, yours is a little bit different. You do a hyperquest. Um, do you want to briefly describe what that is for people? Yeah, hyperquest, it just kind of builds off of, uh, I guess, combining a web quest and the hyperdocs. Uh, they can come in any form that you can imagine. Uh, I've done them using docs. I've done them using slides, uh, you know, making a Weebly page. But in essence, it's, uh, you know, teaching sixth grade. Uh, they're a little bit, um, I guess, breaking them in for Garth going up to seventh grade using the technology. Um, but it's just very laid out, like step one, you know, read this article take this form, uh, maybe Ed Puzzles, but any kind of technology that we use normally is in there. And it's just an array of knowledge to put in one place. And then it always ends, uh, mine always ends with some type of project. Um, I'm big on project-based learning, um, which leads to like the accidental learning we are talking about with the autonomy. Um, but, you know, it's just a series of, you know, maybe five days, uh, four or five days talking and teaching about something and then kind of setting the students loose on um, creating whatever they want to create. I mean, we have s'mores and tutorials and websites and videos. And I mean, it's just countless. I, I go um, before we left for the coronavirus, um, a few weeks prior to that, we were doing a project, I think, on ancient Egypt and I had 22 students in the class and I just walked around looking. There was eight different things going on, like eight different projects. So it's pretty cool to see. You um, mean software projects? 
Pardon me? Software project. So they were using eight yeah. softwares to complete it. Yeah, eight, uh, yeah, eight different uh, tools, I guess, to build their project. But um, very engaging, too. The students, once they get used to that freedom, um, they kind of take it and run with it. And one thing I, I always try to do, if students come with an idea, I rarely say no. You know, if they want to do, some kids have made a TikTok on government. Some kids have done a video or, or like stop motion animation on government or something. You know, there's, um, if they have a good idea, uh, let them do it and see what comes out, you know. We also have a presentation we'll put in the show notes for HyperQuests. I'll just put a link to that Google slideshow as well. If anybody's interested in learning more about the way you're doing that and the way we're kind of using that in the two schools, we'll put that presentation link in the show notes. So that takes Anything else? I think we need to kind of move on. We're about 20 minutes in already, so um, we'll just move on. I think that gives enough. I'll just speak real quick to this. Um, we show mastery, at least in seventh grade, we're using Google Forms. So we're getting that self, um, self-graded self stuff. Kids get an immediate score. Each quest has its own series of questions, usually with readings, imagery, and vocab. So we're trying to check for a basic understanding of the knowledge before they build the project, which is what JC was kind of getting at. So we are pretty convinced um, that I'm usually running, my averages typically are like 87 to 88 in seventh grade for the whole seventh grade class as we run through this. Now that means there's some kids getting, you know, a 60, but the majority of the kids are doing very well. And then we kind of open up the house. Okay, now you build, what do you want to create? I think that kind of gets us enough based on the time to move on to the next phrase because we really want to spend our time on the book. Yeah, the only thing that I want to add while we're going on this next slide is um, my Dublin uses Schoology as an LMS. So I've taken a lot of like the quizzes and things like that and converted them into that LMS just in case anybody who's watching is thinking that they have an LMS that they need to use. You can definitely and absolutely just kind of convert this stuff into there without it being um, without it being too complicated. So for purpose, I'll quickly point out this one and then we'll move on. The idea of purpose is to give kids a, a true audience, to give them something beyond the teacher. When they do something for me, they do it good enough. When they do it for the world, they do much better. So the idea is how do we how do we expand it? Well, I found interesting, and we were kind of looking at these quotes. This was a uh, another project I'm doing with kids that have graduated called the Legacy Map. So I'm trying to kind of keep pace with all the kids I've had over the years. Um, and they're kind of submitting some things and where they're at in life. And this kid wrote this, you know, a new thought process. Um, but what I really like this part down here, he talked about the concept, or, you know, let me just read that. Recognize and respect differing opinions, understanding what you say and publish has consequences. The power of the individual. Any one person can inc incite change. In other words, although at times it may seem insignificant as only one person, your voice really matters. Giving kids purpose, their voice matters. One way we've done that in our school is what we call our legacy wall, which are kind of seeing that image of the, uh, of the hallway in our school building where kids pick the best projects from other kids to, to populate up the walls. Those are all QR coded directly to the project. So um, another piece is that in my room, the kids stamp the legacy wall every year. So there's this purpose beyond. And the purpose I use, I think Travis used, and I think JC, we all use the same purpose is that your work is going to teach next year's kids. So their purpose is they're going to teach kids next year and the following year and the year after that. So their work is living on in our school. It's not like you turn it in, I hand it back to you, put it in your three ring binder and nobody ever sees it again. The work becomes living that is built upon and added, which is kind of like the online book. Anything to add on this? You could call this like the Hall of Fame out there too. So every kid, every parent, everybody that walks through our hallways can see the things that other students have done. Well, I think we'll move on if there's no, nothing else anybody wants to add there. Travis, you want to comment on this one? It's that same idea, but you want to, you want to comment? Um, I, I mean, like you said, it's the same idea. So the, the only um, additional piece here that that we have highlighted on on the on the left is that the audience moves from being um, your notebook or your refrigerator to the world. Um, you know, when when we were kids and we 
had a project, we got a report card. And I remember distinctly going home and putting that project on the refrigerator with a magnet and for mom and dad to be able to see. Um, you know, a lot of what we're trying to do is make that refrigerator move it from being inside somebody's home to the whole world. So being able to put something out that everybody can see and that students can really be proud of um, for sharing this information, creating their their legacy. Right, I always tell my sixth graders, you know, their name is the most important thing that they'll ever have. And uh, if it's something has your name on it, it better be good enough for the whole world to see because it's quite possible that that can happen. That's a good point. <laughs> I like that. Moving on. So let's get into these wiki books. Um, I'll, I'll make this quick so we can get to the actual Google Sites. Um, I don't think this presentation is really meant to be, um, here's how you build a Google Site. I don't think that's what our goal was. It was to try to get you to think about this. We start. You do have tutorials on how to build a Google Site on our Teachers for Tomorrow page. And we can put those in the show notes as well, the tutorials. Um, this all started back in 2006, so this has been going on for a long time. We started it in the wiki, wiki spaces, originally the book. So the way this kind of plays out is two years ago, or three years ago, wiki spaces closed. Um, what you're looking at on the left is a video um, of me kind of reviewing the day before wiki space shut down, the book that was online for kids. Uh, that's about 20 minutes, so it's fairly long. But it kind of goes through what 1,400 kids over three schools had built. Um, then I got into conversations with Travis um, and about how do we keep this going? You know, there's been so many kids participate. There's so many kids that go back and look at what they did five years ago and how it's changed and how, because it can manipulate and change as time passed. So we kept looking for an alternative. We decided um, to go to Google Sites. So I, I almost think it's it's more appropriate maybe to start with ninth grade, even though it says B, because you tested it first before we moved the seventh grade book there. So do you want to kind of, we want to click on that one and kind of talk a little bit about how you did it, what you tried in your class, and how you thought it worked. Sure. So what I did is I took one of my class periods, um, and I believe there were... 18 students in there, maybe 20 students, and I, I created the categories that you see um, on the side there where it says background of World War One, outbreak of World War One, Western, Eastern, and um, and I divided the class out and I, I allowed the kids to pick their groups and then I allowed them to kind of pick which topic they wanted to do. And I said, okay, we're going to create a textbook for other students to be able to use. Um, you guys, at, you know, you guys need to Basically, all I gave them was you're getting the, the topic of the background, World War One, or you're getting outbreak. Um, and I let them get started. And after a day or two, we then came together as a group and said, OK, as a whole class and said, OK, what items do we think should be included within the background? And the students then kind of even created their own outline of what things needed to be included within each. So um, each group was um, they designed a page for um, the topic there on the on the on the side. Everything in here was written by them. Um, pictures were either drawn by them um, or most of them were found. Um, now they did use um, the the common the common license, so they made sure that everything was common license, and they put the the book together and organized it the way that they thought was gonna makes sense for for them is there a page in particular you think you that visually you like the best um try the western front trying to rem remember which one they had um a couple there i know there was a satori or um or yeah, two that were you did a few things where they're embedded well, generally speaking, what did your kids think of this? How did they like it? What was the concept? What went wrong? What was good? What was bad? You know, that kind of stuff. The kids liked it. Um, they, some of them really struggled with it because they were so worried about like, well, what if I'm not getting the information that the teacher wants me to know? So um, helping them work past that was, was really good and really helpful. Um, some of the struggles were, um, 
So one negative with, I guess one negative with the Google Sites is that it doesn't automatically back up. So if somebody accidentally deletes something, it's gone. And we did actually have somebody accidentally delete um, an entire page. Now, luckily it was after the first revision process. So like the entire class just jumped back onto that page and retyped the whole thing up. It took us as a class, it probably took 15 minutes. Um, which is pretty impressive because that tells you that they were reading each other's pages and understanding it enough that they could help rebuild it within 15 minutes. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Um, so there were there were some um, some hiccups like that, but for the most part, once the students got into it and they realized that other students were going to be able to watch this and view it, and um, it it could be beneficial for other students to use, they were really into. Um, leaving behind this this wonderful piece of work that could be, um, you know, part of their legacy. That's pretty cool. Did I mean okay? So you only then you got transferred back to seventh grade. So let's make this clear. So ninth grade kids built this. They built it as a class. So we've got three different examples. JC is doing individual kids building their own book. I'm doing collaborative book with kids now in your seventh grade classes and kids from before. Um, would you have went back to that book? and edited it, or would you have started a brand new book? Um, I would have gone back to edit that book. And on one of the slides at the very beginning there, when JC clicked on it, um, there was the, some of the text had lines struck through it. So yeah. um, um, I think it was under, yeah. The outbreak, yeah. So where you see the lines through the, the writing, that was another student editing it. And the way that we did it was they sh they put a line through what they thought should be removed, and then they typed in the new information behind it. And then um, the goal here was going to be that for year two, um, the students go back and they look at, you know, a group of students would go and look at this outbreak section and read the edited part and the non-edited part and kind of summarize and, and turn it into what they thought was going to be the best. Okay. JC, I, I noticed you have a visitor. So yep, nap time this is, uh, slowly. remote teaching at its finest. Nap time is over. Um, do you want to try to talk about yours real quick? Uh, and we'll do it out of order, but then that way, if you have to go, at least um, we can take over and finish if you need to. Um, well, so I guess with my part of the textbook, I'm not sure what's linked here, but we do have, okay, here are my examples. So, um, for the sixth grade group, what I'm doing this year, um, since we don't use a textbook, I just try to get our students to create their own textbook, which gives them a ton of freedom of what content goes in there. Um, well, I get, shouldn't say the content, but I guess how they design it, the image, imagery that they use, the videos that they choose to put in there. Um, you know, if we could just take a look. I, I broke it down and I gave them a template. Um, I gave them this template because this is how uh, we break down our school year, and obviously we're not finished with it yet. But uh, you know, just yeah, you the, gave them the framework, right? Yes, yeah. I I gave them a template of just the pages, pretty much. So, and then they would go to the page and um, add and whatever content that we covered. So um, it is rough. I mean, there are spelling errors, and um, you know, but. There's imagery. I mean, all the information that you really need for sixth grade social studies is here. Um, now, obviously, I chose uh, excellent um, textbooks that students have done, but uh, this student, they created this through uh, Google Drawings just to explain a timeline, um, picked out different imagery for latitude and longitude. Um, so, can you do me a favor? Just again, I don't mean again. I'm kind of putting you on the spot too. Go to human rights on this one. Oh. So the human rights. My assumption is you covered the same stuff in between this, but you had another one that was going to human rights. So if you yeah. scroll down, right, you've got this kid's page, and then I want to go look at the other kid's page on human rights and just see how they're different, so we can oh, kind of compare yeah. them. In mind. It looks so daddy. I see. Isn't this really good work? Yeah. The two year old approves of it. So it's good. It must yeah. be good. Yeah, it's a blue hand. Okay, so this is uh let's see. Um That's an infograph. Yeah. 
I don't know if she built this one or not, but she found it and embedded in there. But essentially, this is turning into uh, another one of our electronic portfolios. Uh, this is a Sutori here, um, going over like the history of human rights. Now, uh, why is it? Did she have to convert it to a? It looks like it's almost in a doc format. Is that just how it converted? Um, I think she had to yeah. export it to a PDF. Oh, okay. Now, one thing that I want to add to um, what JC was saying a, a few minutes ago was he, he was mentioning that there are some spelling errors or things like this. So language arts teachers, this would be an excellent time and place for you to be able to work with your social studies teachers to help them um, have some purpose and meaning, like real meaning behind the, um, the editing process. So um, just to kind of answer, you know, Garth's question earlier about how could other subjects get involved, um, I think that would be a really good and easy way for um, language arts to get involved within a process like this. Well, yeah, that's a great chance for collaboration, you know, cross-curricular collaboration as well. Well, and just as you scroll down this page, the difference between what those two kids did mm -hmm. is very visually striking. You can see the difference immediately. So right. this link uh, going to the Satori, not sure. Here we go. Okay, so this is the same thing. This the other um, student just embedded it. This one. This one is the actual site here from Satori. So lots of imagery, and again, I you know I just said make a tutorial, make sure there's a picture, a date, an explanation, and this is what the student chose to come up with. So uh, lots of freedom, lots of student choice. Um, and again, like as I spoke earlier, the creativity that you will find is, is pretty cool that um, they, you know, the things that they can come up with are just, you can kind of see what their vision is as well. Do you want to show that third example, the one in the middle you didn't show yet? Yeah. Um, so uh, beginning of the year, we just make these avatars, something fun for the students to get into it. Um, what's one we haven't seen yet? Everything we went over with government, you know, we do like, so basically how it works, I'll teach three to five or seven days, however long it takes for, to me, for me to give them the content. And then they take this, the content, or the information that I gave them and turn it into a textbook. You know, I do um, stress to make it aesthetically aesthetically pleasing and, uh, you know, they make their own charts and pictures. Uh, here's another electronic portfolio where we're using my maps. Um, if you followed us for any amount of time, you can, you know, that we are my maps fans. Yeah. Um, so, but uh, yeah, again, a, a very different layout from the other two textbooks. And um, so it's almost, you know, I'm, again, I've looked at these before, but it's kind of almost too like this textbook could be almost like a, a digital, it's their digital notes too, really. I mean, you yeah. look at, you've got like bulleted points, so key things to remember. So they're using it. In this case, they're they're building their own electronic portfolio of the entire year. We can call that a book. We can call it an electronic portfolio. But they're kind of highlighting everything they're learning in one central location. Yeah, if they ever need to review something from sixth grade social studies, even next year, they could go back to pull up their uh, textbook and should be able to find it. Yeah, this could be really beneficial when you when in seventh grade you start talking about. Um, the Roman Republic and the tripartite government based off of what I just see on this slide alone. Yes. Yeah. Well, this is where, I mean, we left off, we left school right after Egypt. So we still have Mesopotamia, India, China, and then in sixth grade, uh, we pick up Greece and Rome, um, kind of a, a big preview for that for next year for when they get into seventh grade. Well, and the other piece is which, you know, Travis, not necessarily involved in these conversations, but that was the gist of how this kind of played out. You know, I was doing the online book where I talked to JC, there, we were doing videos, they were doing videos to themselves for seventh grade to refresh their memory of things they learned and the book just became the next thing. Well, that's a great way for them to carry up predominantly everything they've done. But they're doing it in two ways, really. They're doing it that way and with my maps. 
So I guess if you want to go back, actually, JC, we'll look at the seventh grade. I don't know. Are you okay to keep talking for a few more minutes? Yeah. Okay. So what we did with this one, this is a, a slightly different than the two we've looked at. So Travis looked at a, a class of, let's say, 20 kids working. JC is looking at a class, individual. You have 135 kids, and they're all doing their own book, right? Right. Now, so he's now that range, I think my goal at the end of the year, uh, well, obviously it will change now, but um, I had envisioned maybe taking 10 students that were really into this and having them kind of take all the best parts of theirs and creating one like master copy of a sixth grade textbook. That's a clever idea. Well, the seventh grade is similar to what you just said. The seventh grade is more of a collaboration of 1600 kids over 12 years. So this is constantly changing and updating and the projects are, or we're pulling projects and putting different projects in. Um, again, uh, you know, I don't care. Let's, we'll go to the, I don't know, go to the Renaissance page. So the way this is done, everything is kid created. So that video that's right there, the reason I pulled to this one is because I knew that video was on here. Um, if you, you don't need to do this, we don't need to play it, but you can play us 30 seconds of it while we're kind of talking. So this is a 12 year old um, who built this as a documentary format. The Black um, Death was a lethal monstrosity. That this had about 300,000 views on YouTube. So his legacy has extended way beyond um, a bunch of kids in Beachwood Middle School looking at his videos. So that video is made by a student, as are all the videos in here, with the exception of about six that are done by um, uh, history teachers, which is, um, why can't I, uh, Anne, what's Anne's name, do you remember? I can't think of her name right now, out of Hawaii. But everything's written by kids uh, collaboratively, so they're going in and editing. All the links are made by kids. Um, Everything that you see is done by a student. So now we're going to get into, uh, it looks like down here we got a gallery of thing links. So the kids, I assume, are doing thing links. And these, I can't remember if that's exactly what's on these pages. But they're kind of building this entire page over time. Um, as you begin to see, everything is, Travis mentioned that Creative Commons. So if you click on that picture of the guy on the left, Of course, I probably picked one that doesn't work. They should all be linked directly to the Creative Commons link where they're getting the imagery. But the book itself is the difference between what we've seen so far is the book is now only student created. And I think it's between Travis's of text, predominantly text with imagery, to now kids' projects being embedded inside of it. If he scrolls down, there's another video made by a totally different kid about the printing press. And he literally watched the kid up front, watched his, and he said, well, the printing press was a major thing. And he kind of copied him. He was two years later. Um, but everything's linked. The kids create all the links, so they take you where they want you to go to learn about Johann Gutenberg or wherever they want to take you. And again, I don't know where all these links are going to take us to. And sometimes the links take you to another page in the book that a kid was interested enough in say Gutenberg, and he decided he was gonna create a whole new page just on Gutenberg himself, so. Well, I can tell you a good one of that, actually. If we go to the Reformation page, it made me think of it as on the Reformation. Reformation page is a little bit more like, like Travis, I kind of gave a background with the kids. I said, we should have a background, what's the key events, who are the key players, what's going on? But if you scroll down a little bit, um, we'll come back to that in a second. Just keep scrolling down. You get to the bulleted points where they started writing one, two, three, four, five. Like these are what you need to know. So it's written kind of like a book, but it's also written like notes. So it's kind of combining everything that we've seen, um, as well as you're seeing a lot more of the kids. If you scroll down, I believe, you can just go to the bottom of the page. We don't need to look too much at it all. Um, you know, there's a lot in here that the kids have built, which is pretty cool. Stop motion animation, explaining the reformation with stop motion animation created by a kid. Um, I, I thought there were thing links on these pages, but all the way at the top. So there might be at the bottom if you scroll all the way to the bottom. No, there isn't on this one. And then there's a slideshow that some kid did, the effects. But all the way at the top, there's a picture of, of um, 
Martin Luther. And it says here, for some background mm -hmm. information, it's the caption, not the link. JC, just down a little bit more. Right so, uh, yeah, some background information on Martin Luther King here. So there was a kid, um, he's in college right now, I remember him. He's like, oh, I wanna know more about like Martin Luther's um, life and his background and what his parents were like. So he wrote this whole page on his own. Nobody's really ever edited it because nobody cares. I hate to say that if you're listening, but he loved this and he wanted to tell this story. So you get down, he's got all this background information on who he was, um, which is just interesting. Is it something other kids need to know? No, but the idea was he posted this because he was interested and he wanted it there. Two kids That's almost 10 years ago. Yeah. 2011. Yeah. I would say he was pretty intrinsically motivated, huh? He was. And he thought that for some reason this was one of those things that um, – you know, even if nobody else ever read, he wanted to leave this here if somebody needed it. You know, I, there's a lot we could show on this. And, and I actually, the one thing I don't like about Google Sites that I liked so much more on Wikispaces was you could see the kids working on it over the summer. They literally would go in and be editing over the summer. Um, this was open. There were kids at the high school that would come back and change things as they learned more. And they would add links to readings that, that they thought the kids would be, that they found you know, in high school world history, they would send back stuff and say, hey, check this out. This is cool. It's going to help you with this part of the book. So the idea is they began to collaborate with a large group of kids. Um, and it really became a living document. It was organic. It just kept growing. And it still is. And I think so we've got three different versions of how you can use Google Slides. You can individually have kids use it like as a portfolio or, or their classroom book. You've got a class building as a um, summary of what they've learned or the research and learning in itself, but it's left behind for other kids to learn from. That could be edited. That could become more like the seventh grade book where it's just the outline was established 10 years ago. And if we looked at it in 2007 when it started, it looked a lot like Travis's. It was just text and a couple of images. And the next year, the kids looked at it and they're like, well, this is just like any book. There should be video and there should be thing link and there should be these things. And so over time, that organically began to populate the book and become something that's engaging to kids to use to learn from. Yeah, I would say that that was one of the one of the complaints that I got from my students when they were doing it. It was afterwards they said, well, this looks just like our regular textbook. Like, what could we like? what's the point? And then with that opened up the conversation of, and I asked them, I go, well, you're right. It does kind of look like your textbook. So what could we do differently? And then that was when they started saying, well, we should try to add more images. We should try to add more projects. And I said, great, do it. <laughs> like it's your world. If that's what you want to do, you know, go for it. And then again, that was towards the, you know, getting towards the end of the year when state testing and all the AP tests and all that stuff was coming up. So you know, and then I was coming back to the middle, middle school. So it just kind of, I'll say yeah. kind of naturally fizzled out, but. Well, the other piece, you know, and I think as you look at all of these, it's the concept that if you go back to that autonomy, right, that we're giving kids choice. So if we just say autonomy equals choice, give kids choice. Then, you know, if you, if you go back and you think about mastery, Mastery right. means they have to have a base of knowledge to do something. They can't have choice if they don't know stuff. So they've got to learn some mastery. They have to be able to master some basic content to be able to create something that's constructive, that shows their learning that's good. And then that takes us to this mastery book becomes the purpose, right? And the purpose is to share that knowledge to a broader audience. And I can say over... I guess if this started in 2006 and we're now in 2020, that over the last 14 or what is that? Is that 14 years? It is. That um, I think it has a huge impact on engagement and on kids wanting to do unique things to leave their legacy behind for others to see. It gives them purpose. I have to say, you and I have been working together and doing stuff like this for what, seven years now? And I think that the way that you just summarized the mastery, the purpose, and the the autonomy was the was my favorite explanation that I've heard you give for it. Oh well, thanks. <laughs>
Well, here we've been here for about um, almost 45, 50 minutes. So I think we should probably wrap it up. Is there anything anybody else wants to say before we kind of um, wrap this up? Um, thanks for coming. Sorry for it being as, as long as it was, but appreciate you guys and you know anybody coming in to, to watch and to listen and and you know please feel free to share this with anybody and everybody that is willing to listen to three guys talk yeah, three guys babble maybe is a better word yeah. yeah and i mean we have so many resources on our website and if anybody needs or i mean reach out to us email twitter wherever we're always here to help you right you can reach travis at travis at teachersfortomorrow.net. You can reach JC at JC, is it Link? Link, yep, L-E-N-K. At teachersfortomorrow.net. Or you can reach me at Garth at teachersfortomorrow.net, and those will be in the show notes as well. So I'll put those in the show notes. Well, again, thank you to Neotech for um, asking to at least um, digitize these so that people would be able to see them. Uh, Neotech, uh, I remember their first conference where I did the keynote, and that was uh, – 11, 12 years ago now, 11 years ago. Pretty pretty great conference for local, uh, conference free for everybody to attend. Um, so I'm glad you're taking the time to do this and provide this for teachers. And with that, we will sign off. Thank Thanks, you. Everyone.